Okay. My name is Ken Miller. I'm the, uh, the library director, and I'd like to welcome you here to our first ever nonpartisan presentation by the League of Women Voters. We're really delighted uh, to have this, this program today. Uh, Amy, Ur Amy Urstead is a Sioux resident who is a member of the League of Women Voters of Michigan, a nonpartisan group. She offered to provide a public information presentation here on the state ballot proposals. Um, since there's not a local league chapter, she's been, and she's been an active member elsewhere, we are extremely grateful to have you here. Again, as I said, our first ever uh, nonpartisan uh, program from the League of Women Voters. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Amy Yersted. Okay, well I am really pleased to see everyone here. Um, I really appreciate you coming out here in the cold and the rain. Um, don't Please don't forget to grab a voter. Um, if you have friends or neighbors that you'd like them to also have this information, just grab them. I have more in my car, um, so don't feel bad by grabbing a couple of them. I also put papers out there, um, each one talking about the actual, it's the actual verbiage um, that the proposals were or are. Um, and then your, your voter will have the actual ballot version. So one is the long form and the other one is the ballot form. Um, and the others is just a couple of articles that I found in the newspaper and um, the prospect is gonna do um, a whole series on uh, ballot measures. Not Michigan ballot measures, but the whole um, system of ballot measures. Um, and then there's also League of Women Voter membership applications if you'd like to become a League of Women Voters and um, support the things that we do like having ballot um, proposals. Uh, presentations. So let's get started. Um, so for this uh, election day is November 6th um, and there's going to be six ballot proposals on the ballot. And these are the six that are going to be up. Um, so you're going to have one is going to number one is the emergency manager law, and that's actually a referendum. And what referendum means is it's already a law, and the voters are being asked if they want to keep the law or take it off, and that's what a referendum is. The other five are constitutional amendments. These are actually going to change the constitution of your state. Um, you have the collective bargaining one. You have the amend for 25% renewable resources, the quality home care. Um, constitutional amendment for two-thirds vote by legislature um, or people on tax changes and then the, the last one is an amendment for voting on the new international bridges or tunnels so like I said the first one is a referendum which only which is changing a, a, it's changing or removing an existing law Governor Schneider has put this one into place and now the voters are being asked if they want to keep it or not and then the others actually change your constitution so basically what this presentation is, is I'm gonna give you the ballot, what it looks like on your ballot. And then the next several slides after that is gonna have what the proponents want and what the opponents want. So the League of Women Voters of Michigan have asked the opponents and the proponents what they want um, and who's, who's basically sponsoring these uh, ballot measures. So it's always good to know who's, you know, who, who's making you vote, who's putting you on, um, if you look at it. Um, do you want me to read them or I can read all of it? This is the ballot. You have this in your voter, so I probably don't need to read this part. Um, you can always open up to the last page of your last couple of pages of your voter and you'll have this um, to look at whenever you need it. Um, this is what you're gonna look at when you're actually on November 6th voting. And so this is your emergency manager law. This is the one you're at being asked if you want to keep it or not. Um, I'll just briefly go over it. It's a established criteria to assess the financial condition of the local government. Um, authorize the governor to appoint an emergency manager upon the state of finding a financial emergency and allow the emergency manager to act in place of local government. So what happens on this one is basically the area has been deemed that it's not financially prudent anymore. Um, it's on the verge of bankrupt. And the governor is allowed to appoint someone to take over the financial situation. And in doing so, they, the elected representatives, the, pe the, the representatives that the people have put in place don't have as much or if any power anymore. They can't represent their people because now the governor has appointed someone. Um, but they're doing it because it's a financial emergency. So both sides 
there's there's kind of two sides here. One is, well, the city is going to go bankrupt, and that's going to hurt the state. The other side is, well, we have elected representatives. We want those people representing us. And now if you have someone who's appointed, they're not accountable to the people anymore. They're only accountable to the governor. Um, and so that's something um, it's something to tackle with. It's very it's very interesting, but it's a it's a really difficult decision. Uh, let's see what else requires the emergency manager to develop financial and operating plans, which may include modification or termination of contracts. So this is what the powers of the emergency manager will have. Um, they can modify or terminate the contracts, reorganize the government, uh, terminate expenditures, services, and use of assets until the emergency is resolved. Alternately. Uh, they can authorize a state appointed review team to enter into a local government approved consent decree. Um, so, and I've also, I've heard, so I've heard that they will be some review, like some local, uh, like basically your community would be able to get together and go and talk about what's going on and, and tell them whether they're disagree or agreeing with what's going on. Now, how much power that will bring, I'm not sure. Uh, places like Flint and others have, have already um, had this emergency manager. Um, mechanism put into place and oftentimes they find it's people with um, it's communities with uh, high minority populations is often is what um, it, it's it seems where that's where the emergency manager comes in it has taken over in those areas um, so these are the proponents of the emergency manager um, law so it was passed in 2011 by the majority of Michigan legislature and it was signed by the governor um, in order to update the former emergency manager law. Under um, PA4, emergency managers gain new power to deal with financial emergencies, including having authority previously vested in local elected officials and to reject, modify, or terminate contracts and collective bargaining agreements. The governor is responsible for appointing emergency manager after declaring a financial emergency. The emergency manager must submit action plan to state treasurer and hold public meeting on it. Emergency managers are seen as needed alternatives to filing for bankruptcy in order to protect the credit of the state. And so that's, those are what the proponents say for the emergency manager. Oh, and then a yes vote will put, will put it into effect. So if you vote no, there'll be no emergency manager act. And if you say yes, there will be an emergency manager. That one's a little bit confusing. Um, I, I thought it was, but. So yes keeps it keeps it going and no says no um, so these are this slide talks about who who are for it the citizens for financial responsibility was formed by LeBrant Michigan Bankers Association vice president of government relations John Llewellyn Llewellyn, Llewellyn? okay and Larry Meyer uh, former CEO of Michigan retailers Association <coughs> so those are those are the people who are paying for a lot of those ads probably that you're seeing on television Business leaders um, for Michigan also support it. Um, so, and then these are their um, people who are not supporting it, or this is first why they don't support it, and then we'll have a slide about um, who are not supporting it. So, Stand Up for Democracy and others oppose PA4 of 2011 and see it as a power grab by the governor and Michigan legislature. Opponents argue that the broad powers given the emergency manager, such as eliminating the role of locally elected officials, altering contracts, firing employees, suspending collective bargaining agreements, outsourcing, merging cities or school districts, and selling assets goes too far. Many believe that PA 72 of 1990, the emergency financial manager law, which PA 4 replaced, is adequate for dealing with financial crisis and blame reductions in state revenue sharing for causing the crisis. Currently, Flint, Benton, Harbor, um, Ecorse, Pontiac, Detroit Public Schools, and Highland Park Schools are being operated under PA 72 of 1990. Um, and then, like I said before, the note will repeal this um, law. And these are the opponents to this measure, um, and they're paying for a lot of the ads and whatnot, is American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, and Michigan Education Association. And this is where they got it from. Um, so if you want to go online, uh, this is for those that are, I guess this is just information, stand up for democracy. I think that's, they're, they're for this. Okay, so that was the Emergency Manager Act. The, the League of Women Voters of Michigan actually um, 
they have a they do have a position on that one of the, of the six they have a position on three of them um, they're saying no on that one because of the lack of representation the fact the idea of not being able to have your representative representing your interests um, and that the person who's appointed isn't accountable to the voters they find um, fault with that a lot of fault that's kind of um, against democracy um, and so if you want to read more information about that I do have a piece of paper on the back um, talking about where the league got their uh, position. They do um, several years of research before they come up with their positions, and so it's very thought thought out before they decide to um, make it make it official. So the next um, proposal is the collective bargaining one, and this one is the the first of the five of actually changing the constitution. Um, so this one will grant public and private employees a constitutional right to organize and bargain collectively through labor unions. So this, this wording is what you're going to see on your ballot. It will validate the existing or future state or local laws that limit the ability to join unions and bargain collectively and to no negotiate and enforce collective bargaining agreements, including employees' financial support of their labor unions. Laws may be enacted to prohibit public employees from striking. Override states' laws that regulate hours and conditions of employee to the existence, the extent that these laws conflict with uh, collective bargaining agreements. And the proposal will define employer as a person or an entity employing one or more employees. So these are the proponents, this is what they want. They establish people's rights to organize, join or assist unions and to bargain collectively with public or private employers regard, regarding the wages, hours and other employment conditions. It prohibits employers from retaliating against employees for exercising those rights, prohibits state and local governments from interfering with those rights, and prohibits government from blocking agreements respecting employees' financial support to their unions. And it grant, grants state civil service employees collective bargaining rights while authorizing the state to restrict or prohibit public employee strikes. Um, and I've heard that already in Michigan, it's already against the law to have strikes. So um, I think they're just adding that a little bit. It protects current laws establishing minimum wages, hours, and working conditions. Uh, the proposal doesn't add any rights workers don't already have. It doesn't force people to join unions. And these are the backers of, um, of this proposal. The National Unity, UAW, UAW Solidarity House, Michigan Education Association, um, and the AFSCME. So if you want to go online, you can um, protect our jobs, has a lot of information about why they support this proposal. And here are the opponents to the measure. This proposal enshrines the agenda of the Washington DC union bosses and Michigan's constitution, resulting in higher taxes, a fundamental lack of fairness and fewer jobs. Uh, government workers would receive higher pensions and better benefits even during tough economic times and nearly 80 laws would be overturned, jeopardizing the state's progress so far. Our ability to remove bad teachers would get gutted, shortchanging our children's education. And just as no one should be forbidden from joining unions, workers should not be forced to join a union or pay dues to political organization they don't support. So as you, you can see, the language changes as well, because I think the league, when they made this slide, they just kind of copy, copy and paste the proponents and the opponents. Um, and so you're definitely getting both versions. <laughs> Um, the financial um, backer, they're opposing this one to, for those opposition ads that you're finding on television and elsewhere. Michigan Chamber of Commerce, the Business Leaders for Michigan, and Protecting Michigan's Constitution. Um, and then this is, there's no information on the source of funding for protecting Michigan taxpayers. And this is where you can find the opponent side mm -hmm. online at protectingmichigantaxpayers.com. Okay, so ballot proposal three. This one is establishing standards for renewable energy. Um, and the League of Voters has a position on this one um, because they do have an environmental branch. They've done a lot of research on. Um, I actually have a highlight. <coughs> We'll go over the ballot real quick and then um, I'll go over what the lead says. Um, so this proposal would require electric utilities to provide at least 25% of their annual retail sales of electricity from renewable energy sources, which are wind, solar, biomass, hydropower, by 2025. 
at a limit to not more than 1% year electric utility rate increases charged to consumers only to achieve compliance with renewable energy standard and allow annual extensions of the deadline to meet the 25% in order to prevent rate increases over the 1% limit. Um, and it requires the legislature to enact additional laws to encourage the use of Michigan-made equipment and employment of Michigan residents. So this is actually, this one is changing your constitution. It already, there's already um, currently one in the constitution now, and I think it's for 2015. Um, I don't know if anybody knows that one or not. Um, and it says something about you have to have like 10% or 15% so, renewable. And now this is going to increase it to 25% to, to 2025. So it's just amending your current constitution that already has um, renewable energy written into it. Uh, oh, here it is. Utilities are on track to meet old standard of 10% renewables by 2015. Um, so these, this is the proponents, and they say that that's no longer good enough over 30 years. I mean, over, compared to the other 30 states, including Midwestern states of Ohio, Illinois, Iowa, and Minnesota have passed new standards of 25% renewables by 2025. Um, these states have not seen significantly higher energy rates, and this proposal limits increases to no more than $1.25 a month. Using more wind and solar energy will reduce pollution and give Michigan cleaner and healthier air and water, protect the Great Lakes, reduce asthma and lung disease, and ultimately save lives. And it will create thousands of jobs and $10 billion in investments. Our present legislative impasse uh, necessitates uh, going to the people to ensure we don't fall behind. And so the proponents for this are Green Tech Action Fund, Natural Resource Defense Council Action Fund, and the Michigan League of Conservation Voters. And the League of Women Voters on this one, um, they say they recommend yes on Proposal 3. A yes vote means electric utilities must provide the 25% by 2025. Um, the League supports predominant reliance on renewable sources and action by appropriate levels of government to encourage the use of renewable resources through state setting policies and mandatory standards. It allows annual extensions of the deadline to meet the standards to prevent rate increases over the 1%. And the League also likes that the Michigan-made equipment and employment of Michigan residents is part of the act. Um, so the opponents, oh, here's where you can get more information on it. Um, Michigan Energy, MichiganJobs.com. So in my energy, in my jobs. And the opponents for this one, they say a ballot Proposal to require 25% of all energy to be produced from the sun or wind by 2025 sidesteps our legislature and proper way to make laws. Current law requires 10% renewable resources by 2015. That is more reasonable, affordable, and attainable approach than cluttering the Constitution. The marketplace is the most effective way to develop Michigan's renewable energy industry, and the legislative process is the most efficient way to set standards. A special interest group should not be allowed to amend our Constitution. And the backers of this one are DTE Energy, DTE Ballot Committee, CMS Energy, Business Leaders of Michigan, Protecting Michigan's Constitution. And that's where we got the information from. And you can go um, to see more about the opponents for that one at careformichigan.com. <coughs> All right, uh, about proposal four, another change to the Constitution. Establish uh, quality home care council and provide collective bargaining for in-home care workers. So this proposal would allow in-home care workers to bargain collectively with Michigan Quality Home Care Council. Continue the current exclusive representative of in-home care workers unit modified in accordance with labor laws. Require MCH CC, I mean MQHCC, to provide training for in-home care workers, create a registry of workers who pass background checks, and provide financial services to patients to manage the cost of in-home care. Preserve patients' rights to hire in-home care workers who are not referred from the MQHCC registry or bargaining unit members. And the proposal would authorize the MQHCC to set minimum compensation standards and terms and conditions of employment. So the proponents say, Citizens for Affordable Quality Home Care, a bipartisan coalition of advocates, law enforcement officials, and community leaders, want to establish the Michigan Quality Home Care Council. 
the 11 member council appointed by the governor will establish a registry helping seniors and those with disabilities obtain home services. The registry will pre-screen workers, do background checks, and provide opportunities for training. The home care workers will have collective bargaining rights, but will not be state employees. Supporters believe the council can protect patients who need home care services, as well as help home care workers find stable employment. The backers for this one are Home Care First Incorporated. And then you can find more information at keephomecaresafe.org. The opponents say this proposal would allow the unionization of home-based caregivers as state employees. If passed, the constitutional amendment would override Public Act 76 of 2012. In 2012, elected officials passed PA 76 to stop the Michigan Quality Community Care Council from collecting dues for the Service Employees International Union on behalf of home care workers. Citizens protecting Michigan's constitution argue that home care workers are not employed by the state, but by their clients, and therefore should not have collective bargaining rights. CPMC notes this is a means to collect union dues and to benefit special interests at taxpayer's expense because union dues are taken out of Medicaid checks sent to patients. So the op opponents say, this is the opponents, um, our Michigan Chamber of Commerce, business leaders uh, for Michigan and protecting Michigan's constitution. And that's where they have the information. And so if you want more, that's handsoffourconstitution.com. They get clever with those addresses. All right, number five. So we only have two more. I have a question. Yes. Um, on that last proposal, they're directly, um, like, and the yes, it says they are not state employees. And the no, they say they are going to be state employees. Right. Um, I, Somebody's not telling the truth. I know, right? <laughs> That's kind of how it comes when you get the opponents and proponents. Um, I would have to do more research to find that out, to actually find that one out. Um, I think it's like an indirect. I think they're indirectly paid, is what I'm guessing. Um, so that's why it's kind of on the line. It's in that gray area. So they're probably, they are working for the client, for the patient, but then they're probably indirectly paid by the state is what I'm guessing. But if anybody knows more, please um, enlighten us. That would be great. Um, but you know what, you, if you want to find out more information, I can guarantee that the League of Voters of Michigan will know more. So you can look on your voter. I'm sure there's a phone number on there to find out. And, and I'll actually, I can call them as well and uh, find out. And if you want to call me or email me, and I'll tell you what they say. So I can do that as well. Um, any excuse to call the League, I get excited. So. Um, so this next one is enactment of new taxes by state government. So this one will change the constitution for taxes. All right, so the ballot's gonna say, the proposal would require a two-thirds majority vote of the state house and the state senate, or a statewide vote of the people at a November election in order for the state of Michigan to impose new or additional taxes on taxpayers or expand the back base of taxation or increasing the rate of taxation. This proposal would uh, or the section shall in no way be construed to limit or modify tax limitations otherwise created in this constitution. So the Michigan Alliance for Prosperity says, the Michigan Alliance for Prosperity would require two thirds of the Michigan legislature or the voters of Michigan to approve any additional taxes or expand the base of taxation or increase the rate of taxation. This amendment would make it harder to raise taxes in Michigan. Proponents say the requirement will provide a more stable tax structure. 18 other states have similar requirements. Currently in Michigan, the sales tax cannot be increased without a vote of citizens and educational property taxes require a three-fourths majority vote of the legislature to raise. However, property taxes, income taxes, and use taxes can be increased by the majority vote of the legislature. So the Opponents of this are Liberty Bell Agency Incorporated, a shell corporation that shares its address with Central Transport. And they have their information from there. And if you'd like to look online on their site, <coughs> it's miprosperity.com, michiganprosperity.com. And the opponents defend Michigan democracy 
opposes the proposal to amend the, cons the Michigan Constitution to require a supermajority vote of the legislature or a vote of Michigan citizens to raise taxes. The DMD argues this proposal will allow a minority of legislators to thwart the majority of elected officials and will make it more difficult to fund public services such as roads, schools, and state police. Opponents note that the proposal will make it more difficult to eliminate tax expenditures such as loopholes in order to make the tax system more equitable. And according to the DMD, lobbyists and billionaires will be more powerful in controlling the vote. Majority rule has been the foundation of our democracy. And the opponents are business leaders from Michigan and protecting Michigan's constitution. And I just have a word on this one. Um, this one I'm, I'm kind of passionate about. I, uh, the League of Women Voters um, has a position and they are, they are against it. Um, our democracy is a, we usually use majority rule to make up our law, such as raising taxes. And I just moved here from California, and California has a two-thirds. And California, if you've heard anything about it, is in a law of mess. Um, they, there's schools that are closing down all the time, and the libraries are closing down because they can't fund them, because they have, because of the super majority. Um, the idea was that Compromise, and they would have to. You have to get your politicians would have to get together and come up with some, you know, some really interesting deals because there takes so many of them to come up with these deals. You'd have to get bipartisan support was the idea, but that isn't what is happening. It hasn't been bipartisan support. Basically, nothing gets done, um, and that's kind of what would happen if this comes into Michigan. In my opinion, is not a lot is going to happen. Um, things that need to get fixed probably aren't going to get fixed because you can't get enough supporters um, in your legislature to vote on it. Um, I did a, a long paper on this as well, and I mean, it, California's problems, a lot of it stem from this issue right here. Um, there's a lot of others, but the two-thirds majority on your taxes is a big one. Um, and me as a person, I, I don't think it's good, and then the League of Women Voters, um, they have a little bit to say about it as well. They, uh, let's say, um, they, they say a no, no vote continues the current system where a simple majority vote of legislatures is needed to enact new or additional taxes or expand the base of taxation or increase tax rates. It is important to note that the League of Women Voters of Michigan bases its opposition on, the, on its current position, which says taxation and budgeting. League of Women Voters of Michigan supports the development of state local tax structure, which is adequate, equitable, flexible, and moderately progressive. The legislature should have broad and fundamental taxing powers, free of constitutional restrictions, except for constitutional provisions requiring a balanced budget and property tax millage limits. If this amendment to the, con the Michigan Constitution passed, a small minority in the legislature would control what happens with taxes unless there was a general election on this issue. This proposal would not allow the flexibility to govern during difficult times. And so that's what the League of um, Legal and Voters in Michigan says. So, so that's a, that's a, that one ha could have some serious consequences. Um, and so if you want more information on the opponents, defend, uh, defend Michigan, midemocracy.net. <coughs> Last one is regarding the construction of international bridges and tunnels, and this will also change your constitution. So this proposal would require the approval of a majority of voters at a statewide election and in each municipality where new international bridges or tunnels for motor vehicles are to be located before the state of Michigan may expend state funds or resources for acquiring land, designing, soliciting bids for, constructing, financing, or promoting new international bridges or tunnels. The proposal would create a definition of new international bridges or tunnels for motor vehicles that means any bridge or tunnel which is not open to the public and serving traffic as of 2012. So this could have implications for Sault Ste. Marie down in the future. People should decide assets, or I mean, people should decide, decide asserts that Michigan taxpayers could end up footing the bill for a multi-billion dollar new bridge to Canada at a time when we need to be investing in jobs and schools. So the proponents are the people should decide, and this is what they're saying. The Detroit International Bridge Company has offered to build a privately funded second span adjacent to the Ambassador Bridge, which it owns. Um, the new International Trade Crossing Bridge is another location will draw substantial traffic from the Blue Water Bridge, Detroit, Windsor Tunnel, and Ambassador Bridge. People should decide 
posits that NITC project is economically unviable and risky for Michigan taxpayers as cost and volume forecasts are uncertain. And the backers of this proposal are Detroit International Bridge Company. The opponents, oh, here's the, the proponents, um, the people should decide.com if you want more information. And then opponents are taxpayers against monopolies. Taxpayers against monopolies, which opposes proposal six, notes that this amendment was funded by the Ambassador Bridge's owner. Canada, Ontario, Michigan, and the US governments signed an agreement in June to build the new international trade crossing. The agreement states that Michigan parties shall not be required to pay any of the costs. One quarter of all US Canada trade world's largest two-way relationship crosses the ambassador bridge each year. NITC supporters point to a projected doubling of truck traffic between Detroit and Windsor by 2035. The second bridge will provide a direct highway to highway connection between the U.S. and Canada and provide much needed redundancy critical to national and economic security. The opponents um, are business leaders for Michigan and protecting Michigan's constitution. And if you want more on their side, it's build, build the, is that bridge? Build the DRICnow.com. So that is, those are the six proposals, um, the opponents and proponents and how they feel about it. If you want to find more information about the ballot proposals, um, also, the candidates at vote401.org, you can actually go online and compare the candidates. So you can click, you know, um, I don't know, Dan Beneshek and Gary McDowell, and it'll give you information, which is so neat. Um, I think they just got it up this year, this website, and so it's, it's very user-friendly, and um, you can just keep clicking and find out all these different things about these um, candidates that are running. The election date is November, uh, to register was last week, so that was last Tuesday was the last day to register. Um, and our election day is November 6th. Um, polls open at 7, close at 8. Um, this is all about elig eligibility of voting at the 18, a citizen, a resident for at least 30 days, um, not confined in jail. Um, here's just some numbers about the presidential election in Michigan. Um, out of 7,613,000 people or um, people voting of age, 7,470 and some were registered to vote, which was 98%, that's a lot. Um, however, people that actually came to vote was um, considerably less. Interesting. And then ID needed to register to vote. Um, that's a, a lot of legislation going around in different states about needing your ID. Um, and Michigan has their own. Recommend that you show your ID to register to vote. Um, if you register by mail and do not provide identification, you need to come to the polls with your ID in hand. Um, if you're registering for the first time and submitting your registration by mail, you should accurately enter your state issued ID license number or personal ID card. You can find all this at the county clerk, the secretary of state, the League of Women Voters website, um, anything you need for registering to vote, um, which we should have already done last week. So, But all those websites will have it. And even the library can help also assist you. They have a lot of people that can help. Um, this is registering. We got that. Absentee voting, if you are able to, which is 60 years and older, have someone with disabilities um, out of town for the election. Um, if you're in jail, which you're not because you're here. Um, so uh, here's all about absentee voting as well. And you can find all this as well on the League of Women Voters website as well. Um, same with signing an affidavit. This is, this is a new, um, this is new this year for the Michigan ballot, um, the citizenship question, and it's actually being challenged right now. Um, the governor said he didn't want it. Um, and the Secretary of State is still, Michigan Secretary of State is still putting on there. And so I guess the Supreme Court is going to, it has questions about that. And so that's still, um, they're still working it out. And so it'll probably still be on your ballot, but you're not required to check on there. Um, so 
politics playing out, even on November 6th, besides the candidates and, that, and the ballot measures, we get to be part of this drama. <laughs> um, so I thank you for letting me talk with you. Um, if you want to find more information, uh, blackcheck.org is a, and also Michigan True Squad. So here's some resources if you want to look at them. Oh, and then League of Women Voters of Michigan, that, write that down and you can call. So if you have any questions and if this PowerPoint wasn't enough for you, um, those women and men have lots of information. Um, they are the go-to people. And so that, that is it, that is my um, presentation. Um, if you have any questions or if you want to start a discussion, we can on ballot posts. Does anyone have any questions about any of the six or the voter? I'm surprised that it's that easy to uh, amend the Constitution. I never knew that before. It was a, a vote of the people to change the, yeah. the Constitution, amend the Constitution. Uh, and, and then you hear a number of ads that say, okay, if you vote for that, whatever it is, mm -hmm. to amend the Constitution, it's just cast in concrete and you can't change it. Well, if you can change, if you can amend it with a simple vote of the people right. this year, certainly you could next year, couldn't you? Potentially, yeah. I mean, uh, next time it's go. it's expensive. I mean, either way you go, it's it's going to be expensive because that's a all that money's being thrown into it, and you know, and time to make these ballots, and and the Secretary of State having to write up these proposals and then take it back and getting the verbiage and things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean. Yeah, you can. You can continue to amend the Constitution. I just moved here in May, so I don't know what Michigan's history is on it, um, but I do know California's, and California's been doing it since the 19-teens. Um, and since the progressive era, um, it's, I mean, this has been going on a long time where people want to take um, democracy in their own hands. A lot of people aren't trusting their representatives anymore, and they say, we're gonna do this. We wanna make changes, and we wanna do it right now. And, and that's what's basically happening is we're losing trust in our elected representatives and we're making the changes for good or for bad. So, yeah, it's interesting, yeah. I kept thinking while I was hearing all of this was that I don't understand why there are so many proposals to change the Constitution. It, is it just that our legislature is not doing their job? Well, no, because um, there's the bridge one. I don't know if that's a, if that, I mean, that's kind of debatable whether legislators are doing the job. I mean, that was already in place. I mean, people, the governor and Canada and legislators said that this is what we want, and then some of them <coughs> decided we want to put a ballot, and we want the voters to decide. We don't think what your decision was good enough, and um, and so now they have a lot of funding, that particular bridge company, and so they were able to get enough signatures, and that's really what it comes down to, is if you can get enough signatures, you can get it on the ballot. Um, and uh, some of, uh, a couple of these, uh, the Supreme Court deemed that the wording wasn't even accurate or what written well enough, and they still got to go, which I'm not really sure how that works here. Um, I'm just, I have three years to learn about it while I'm here, but um, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's uh, I mean, really, it all comes down to if you, people who are asking you to write that, you know, write your name down, and if they can get enough of those signatures, it can get on the ballot. Any other questions? Okay, so the League of Women Voters just took a position on three of those. Mm -hmm. The way they come up with their position is that they have um, they have years of study. I I was on the League of Women Voters um, of San Diego, and I participated in a California a League of Women Voters of California study where we actually studied the initiative process um, in California, and it's a two year study, and we go and do interviews of all kinds of academic people, um, politicians. Um, when we were doing the particular one for the ballot, um, the ballot process in California, we even talked to um, the, the Secretary of State and everyone that works with them and um, county clerks, just trying to find out, even the signatures, actually industries um, in California that are set up to, they're paid to go and get the signatures. So they're not even part of the proposal, they're just paid to go and get the signatures. Um, and there's. They're paid to go and run the campaign um, for that proposal. And so we would go and interview all of them and, and um, read all of these various books and look back and, you know, just how the history has changed and evolved over time. And so two years of that study is what this group will come up with within the league. And then they go and present it 
to the state league and then they'll um, keep it or ask for changes to it or whatnot and then once it's um, a product that they like they will give it to all the leagues throughout the state and then those leagues will vote um, on whether they like that position and then that'll go back up and then they'll vote on it the whole um, state will vote on it and so it's a, it's a very grassroots long process um, very methodical and it was really interesting. Um, yeah. So that, that was, and that's pretty much how every state um, and the league will do it. Every you know, legal and voters of Michigan, they don't really have any um, studies going on right now, but um, they're all very thought out like that. So it's a lot of work. That's all I can say. It's a lot of work. <laughs> any other questions um, on the ballot measures themselves at all? Be glad you're not in Florida. I heard theirs is like 10 pages or something. It's very long. California has, I think, 10 measures, 10, 10 or 12 measures. So we only have six. <laughs> All right. Well, don't forget to grab a voter. Um, and if you'd like any of those um, handouts that I put on the table, feel free to take them. More reading.